Hi guys and welcome back to NodeFlow. So today it's a second session of Copernicus. We'll see together what UVs are from a more general standpoint. Then we'll focus on how UVs are understood by Copernicus. And lastly, how to distort them to achieve more complex results. So without further ado, let's dive into Dini and let's start. <music> In Houdini, the first thing I will do is to create a component and then I will go inside. Over here, I will create a UV map. So UVs are a vector two. It's the same logic as when we talk about position. Position is a vector three and we have three components, X, Y, and Z. In this case, if I want to see U and V separated, I can just use a node called channel split. I can now put it here and connect it. And by default, it will just show me the first one. If I want to see the second one, I will just change it to green. I will also create some nodes and I will connect the first one in the red channel and the second one in the green channel. I will then name the first one U and the second one V. So if you worked with UVs in the past, in other softwares, we will just see a ramp going from zero to one. While in this case, we also have negative values. In Copernicus, UVs go from minus one to one. If I would like to simulate how UVs work in another software, I will just need to use a remap to specify that my UV range goes from minus one to one. So that goes just by saying that UVs in Copernicus have a different range and that UVs in general can be considered as a vector two. Now that we have this out of the way, I would like to talk about the relationship between UVs and an image. So I will use the file node to import an image. Instead of importing an external image, I would like to use one of these images that comes with Houdini. So I will just drop this path over over here. So I will create a UV map again. I will then use a UV transform. I will just connect it. And now I will create a UV sample. The UV sample allows me to apply a certain kind of UVs to our image over here. So if I connect my texture and my UVs, I will see that nothing really changes, but I have a way to control my UVs in the UV transform. So if I just change the scale, you will see that I will basically change my tiling. And if I just change the rotation, I can just change the rotation of my image. So you see basically, of course, UVs and textures are connected. And usually what we prefer to do is manipulate the underlying UVs instead of the image itself. We can now proceed adding some distortions. So first of all, I would like to import instead of my simple image over here, I will just duplicate it. And I already downloaded an image of the one and only Copernicus. So if I go here and I just paste my path, you see this image is just Copernicus. And I think I found it on Wikipedia. It's, I think it's one of the first images that pops up. Then you see it's not a square as we can also see in the preview over here in the nodes. So in order to make it square, I will use a node called crop put it here and then I will connect the color in the source. And now we have a square image. The only thing is that of course it's repeating itself. So I will then add a simple transform and changing the scale to something like 1.25 and maybe moving a little bit up. And then we can start to add some distortion. So I'll add a distort and I can just connect the transform into the source. And now you see if I just change the scale, we are just distorting in one direction. If you would like to change the angle, we can just go here and maybe change into this angle. And if I now change the scale again, we are changing in another axis. So behind the scenes, we are still manipulating UVs, but what if we give it custom UVs? You see here in direction, we can also plug some custom UVs. In this case, I would like to use a noise. So we'll just create a fractal noise. We already have some distortion. Going back to the distort, I can change the scale. But the only thing that we see is that the image is shifting. In order to fix that, we need to change a few things into the fractal noise. If we just reduce the center to zero and reducing the roughness to zero, so we'll have smoother results. And then I could play with the element size until I have something a little bit more appealing, I guess something like that. And then I will check 3D noise. That means that my noise will be animated. So now you see if I press play, I will see my image being distorted by my noise. I can control the strength of the effect, always a distort node, so I can either make it stronger or make it like a little bit more delicate. Maybe you are trying to create a texture and you would like to give it imperfections. That's how you will do it with a fractal noise and with a distort node. As an extra, we also have a streak option over here that if I enable it, it's sort of like a motion blur. So you see the parts that will move more, they will be more blurry. Nice. Now we know how to distort an image. But there is actually another way to do that, and that's the distort by slope. When I actually drop this node, that will actually create two of them. A simple distort, as the one that we saw before, that we already know, and we also have a new node called slope direction. So for the sake of this, I will just duplicate my image over here, and I will plug this one a source. But if I visualize the distort, you see I will have an error, and that's because the slope direction needs some input. For now, I will just create something like a ramp. Ramps are, in general, extremely useful for any kind of stuff. And here, we can change the type to 
concentric. And if we go here in the presets, I can change it to hill. And then we have this sort of like donut shape, plug it in the slope direction. And if we visualize the result, we only need to change the scale of the distort node and we will see the effect happening. So why is this slope direction different from a classic distort node? That's because we are computing something that's called the derivative. By instance, if you go inside, you will find a derivative node. But what is a derivative? So basically the derivative is just the rate of change in the values of an input. So if we go here, for instance, here there's a lot of change in value. We're going from something that's almost completely black, so almost zero, to something that would be eventually white, so one. And that's why here we have like a brighter values overall. If we forget for a moment about the colors, this is why we have basically brighter values over here. Then in this part, it will be black or very, very dark. And that's because the values will not change so much over here. They're very, very similar. And here again, we have lots of change and that's why we have brighter values again. So using the derivative, we are able to calculate basically what are considered as the slopes because the slope in the end is just where the values change a lot. So now I could choose to animate this one. So if I go into distort, instead of changing the scale manually, I could just put a simple expression. So maybe like a sign and then dollar f then i will multiply it by something i think something like eight was fine and then i will close my parentheses so now if you check i have a pulsing animation the only thing is that it's very strong and so if you go into the slope direction we can definitely reduce its strength so once we have something that we like first of all we notice that we have some errors on the lower parts and in order to change that we can just change the kernel size you see maybe a value of 50 worked fine for me and now the overall distortion looks a little bit better now i really think that understanding what the derivative is could be very interesting we'll notice that here it's changing a lot and also here it's changing a lot while in the middle it's changing just a few considering like the nose is moving from its position not so much lastly i would like to conclude the video talking about something that i think is still very very important and those are polar uvs let's see what they are and how we can use them so as we saw before in the first example uvs are composed by two monos so let's start from scratch and let's create our simple monos so polar uvs needs a concentric ramp and also radial ramp so if i go here and i look for a ramp i want this one to be radial and the second one i want it to be concentric now instead of splitting the channels i can join them so i can use channel join basically we are building our own uvs so here and here and now we have uvs if you remember before to apply these uvs to an image we use something called the uv sample so i will do exactly the same i will use uv sample i also will need to make sure that this channel join outputs uvs because right now it's rgba so we'll go here into signature and i will choose uvs and then of course i need an image to distort so i will use the same grid that we created before i will put it here and i will just plug it into the texture so you see just by doing that it should be very apparent what we have to change the repetitions or other more interesting stuff we need to use uv transform over here so we define polars as circular coordinates. The first ramp is actually representing the angle and the second one is representing the length. So while the first one will control how many repetitions of the same pattern we have, the second one will control how close or how far from the center they are, right? So that's why we have a UV transform. So in this scale parameter, we can change singularly the U or the V. So let's try to change the U. As you can see, we are adding more repetition, right? I will leave it to something like six. And then we have the V. So if we change the V, we are basically changing the tiling or to be more precise just the distance from the center right now that we use the grid to understand a little bit better what's going on i can look for font and then i can just write here this is a uh, text I can then just duplicate it another time so we have a little bit more characters. Now I can connect this one into my texture and let's see the result. They are very small, but why is that? Because our text is just in the middle of the image. So we need to move it a little bit up. You see, if we move it a little bit like here and we check the sample, we have the result that we were looking for. And you will notice that all of this is reversed. In order to fix it, we can just go back into the UV transform and we can change the scale to minus six. And you can imagine how all of this could be useful for if you're making like a tire or maybe you're making like some pattern on a dish any circular pattern should basically use polar coordinates and that's why i think it's very useful that we understand how they work even like an sdf shape let's choose something like a star i will then make it smaller and i will move it up as we did before so maybe something like that let's convert it to mono i will connect it and now this result i will just plug it into my sample over here and as you can see we already have three different stars and then if you want them to have like a better shape we can just go here after the sdf to mono we can create transform and we can just predistort them before the polar right so we can scale them into the x-axis and for instance if we see now the sample they already look better so let's go here and let's change it until they look exactly as we 
we want. I guess something like that looks fine. And then just playing with the repetitions until we have something that we like. Nice. So I ended up using 24 and maybe lowering this one a little bit, we have a nice circular pattern. That concludes our session today. Let's do a quick recap. So we saw what UVs are from a more general standpoint. We saw that Copernicus works with UVs that goes from minus one to one. Then we saw the relationship that we have between images and UVs. Then we imported our Copernicus and we also learned how to distort it with an animated noise. We then talked about the distortion using a slope. So we said that the slope direction computes the derivative. So that's the parts where we have the higher change in value. And lastly, we introduced the concept of polar coordinates and why they are useful and why they can be used in so many things in Copernicus. So I really hope you learned something new today. If you did, please leave a like and consider subscribing. If you would like to see something specific in Copernicus, you can drop a comment and I will make sure to read it and answer it and we'll definitely take that into consideration for the next topics. Thank you so much for joining me today and I will see you in the next one. Thanks. Thank you.